my name is Christopher Denias. I'm from Lafayette, Louisiana. So I'm in like the southern part of Louisiana. I don't live on the coast, but I'm you know, closer to the coast than northern part. Job title, I'm a freelancer. I specifically do like user experience design. I have like five or six years of like experience doing that now, but I've actually been studying design and like user experience design for over 10 years. Most of my career, we're talking about kind of B2B design last time. Most of my career was doing B2C design as most designers do. You know, I was a generalist like most designers are, uh, became a specialist. So I'll kind of just talk about my kind of journey as a designer and like how I kind of found my way to where I am now. Like I was saying in one of my posts, I'm an expert vetted freelancer on Upwork. So that means I'm in the top 1% of freelancers on the platform. Uh, not really much that comes with it uh, other than like bragging rights, I guess, and a badge on your profile. But I'll show some of the benefits of being on Upwork towards sort of like the, the end of the presentation. So I'm going to kind of like jump to the forward, the beginning of the story, I guess, like before I was full-time freelancing. This was me at Michael's, not necessarily like this isn't me in the picture, but this is like a representation of me basically uh, working at Michael's. It's an art store for anyone who's never been there or is around you know, Michael's. I did a lot of cashier stuff, but they like to have me on the floor. And I like being on the floor too, being like walking around the store, like helping customers. And, you know, I learned a lot about just what makes customers tick. And I love just being able to be closer to the product itself, like making the product, always having like a good presentation, like making sure the aisles are clean, uh, suggesting things to customers. If like items weren't available in the store, like helping them go on the app and find it on there possibly, or another another competitor locally. There's lots of runarounds that can't find the, the easy answer. There's lots of different sections in the store. I was in the, the kids section, but a lot of that was like hobby stuff and you know wood and cricket items like vinyl cutting. So I learned a lot about the products too. And with my background as like a graphic designer and just gone to school for industrial design, which is like physical product design. I spent a lot of the time like studying the products. Like sometimes the products would break and I would just kind of play around with it or something would get lost and we'd find it. Just observing how like how users bought products, like some products were always sold out. You know, there's lots of different kind of psychology behind purchase, I guess. So would you say your experience working in Michaels and just having a go-to being a craft store, it also helped you to become the artist that you are today? Yeah, yeah. I was able to do a job that basically was not necessarily design related, but it was and it was art related. So I was able to enjoy the work I was doing, even though I was only I mean, you're making $8.25 an hour. Mm -hmm. the federal minimum wage is only seven twenty five, dollars So it's like just above that. But, you know, I had a job. The people I was working with were really awesome and supportive. You know, it, it kind of grew me as a character and like as a man as far as how to get out of my own shell, I guess you can say. But um, yeah, this is kind of like where I spent most of my time, like on the aisle, uh, like helping customers as they're walking around the store. And uh, I kind of just wanted to talk about this because it kind of puts you guys in my shoes basically like i wasn't doing design work you know i was struggling to get a job i submitted hundreds of applications and got a couple interviews so like i understand the struggle of what it's like to find a design job and i'm kind of sharing that experience now like the the feeling of hopelessness and all those you know bad things that you're that are in going through your head at the time like did i make the right decision like all kind of self-doubt uh, so i was to ask you a question um yeah how would you exactly say, coming from Michaels, did you go into UX design if you're going to build on that too? Well, I, I already was like into UX design before I went to school for industrial design and even before I went to Michaels. It was kind of like a fallback plan. Like I was looking for a job for UX or industrial design stuff and it wasn't really working like doing both. So I kind of consolidated more portfolio to be just UX design stuff because I actually had experience doing that as a freelancer opposed to my industrial design stuff was purely like college education. So I was able to kind of, I just said, you know, I, I know how to freelance, like why not start freelancing again? So I basically signed up to Upwork and got clients on there. And that's kind of how I transitioned from being like a part-time worker at Michael's 
to having like part-time job at Michael's while I'm also part-time freelancing. And this is kind of, I feel like the path of least resistance that I think a lot of designers don't understand is like an option whenever they're trying to get a job is that like, yes, you can have, you can do your Google certification projects and yes, you can do projects on your own or with your friends, but nothing beats like a real world project, even if it's not on the front page of New York Times or whatever. You know, there's a lot of opportunities on Upwork and that's how I was able to. I was talking about how in the past I did freelancing and like the big problem is why I stopped is because I wasn't getting consistent work. So I found whenever I signed up to Upwork, I was able to fix that problem that I had in the past, essentially. And you'll see kind of like at the as outside of the Venn diagram, I have full-time freelancing. So I'm not doing full-time freelancing. Kind of when I began to do that, I quit my part-time job at Michael's. So mm -hmm. Now, would you say that your time at Michael's helped you understand better the fundamentals of like UX and stuff like that? Or was it just something that kind of just played along with it i mean I, I would say it brought me closer to like the users like i was able to understand the the different type of like personas i guess you could say of like michael shoppers there's the, the grandma who who comes in every once in a while and is picking up jewelry there's the mom who's coming in with her kids and got a project that they have to do for school and she's in a rush then you have the the husband who comes in and uh he has a list of things that the wife wants him to get and he has no idea where they are in the store so it just helped me like put my my hand on the heartbeat of like the customer basically and what their needs and wants are and their pain points i'm very curious for if i could ask another question yeah. how did you go about securing your first um contract role on upwork how did that work out for you yeah well obviously they had to take a chance on me but uh <laughs> I had relevant work, and so I was kind of posting about how the first full-time contract that I got on Upwork, which I took to quit. When I took that job, I quit Michael's that week, and that was a gaming contract. So that was for like a gaming startup called Azurus. It's a Twitch overlay game extension, basically. So you're watching your favorite streamer, and there's essentially like a little UI that would pop up and it's trivia based. And if you get it correct, you would get as a tokens and you could exchange those as a tokens for in-game items, basically. So um, I had I had um, like a small mobile app I had designed for another company called Gamers a couple of years before. And um, I just had experience doing like playing certain games that they were streaming for. And so and just based on the my ability to like ideate, basically, there was a lot of ideation involved. They decided to hire me. And uh, yeah, the rest is history from that point. I, I've continued to full time freelance since that point. Um, like a year and a half ago. And if I could ask, what kind of, because you said that gamers um, was the first ones that you freelance for, yeah. what kind of game categories were they? And um, how do you feel like with your experience with gaming, it really made you feel like you could excel? Because I know you're also a gamer. Um, mostly like the the top <clears throat> or like most popular games at the time, like League of Legends, Call of Duty, the games like that. They would base based their base what they would invest in basically they couldn't do every game i think there were certain games and like certain streamers that they would basically sponsor at azurus um yeah these are just some brands that i've worked with or clients two or are for the gaming companies i've worked with atmos and azurus on the bottom right some of these are just tech companies or health companies uh, insurance companies i'm only going to really talk about one of these in my presentation to kind of give you guys like behind the scenes of like what's actually happening and i'm going to talk about the department of defense one just because it's like near and dear to my heart I'm a big aviation junkie and uh just being able to be in this project that like, was awesome for me i never really felt like i would be able to to actually work on a aviation related project uh, as a designer so uh if we're kind of working from the top basically the way this happened was the department of defense or like uh contract officer would basically post a proposal for bid on a website called samgot.gov. Basically, companies will bid on this job, sort of like on Upwork, except it's companies, like big companies, and they're like million-dollar contracts or even billion-dollar contracts. So what happened is Crowdbotics placed the best bid, and they won on sam.gov, and then Crowdbotics 
goes on to Upwork and they they post their own job application to hire a UX designer. And then I applied to that job application a couple of interviews later. I think it was like a couple of months later too. It wasn't like a very fast process. I didn't really think it was going to be anything because it took so long, but uh, they got back to me and then we saw the contract and uh, this is just showing like the award they actually won. This is like in a public database. So if you wanted to go on usaspinning.gov, you could just look up Crowdbotics and you could see this is the contract they won for $750,000 and it started May, March of 23. So kind of the team composition was uh, one project manager. There were two data scientists, one backend developer. There was one front end developer and then another front end developer joined us later on in the project, probably because the design system grew a lot bigger than they could keep up with, as well as updating. And then me at the bottom, the user experience designer. So I was really the only designer on this project. The like intelligence and just the the realness of being so close to something I was near and dear to. So the way that I kind of referred to this project at the time, because obviously I was contracted during the work currently and I wasn't able to talk about it. So I kind of just referred to it as, you know, this is my Iron Man project. Couldn't really say what I was doing, but I was just like, you know, something that you'd see in an Iron Man movie. Basically what it is, is it's whenever pilots are doing dog fighting practice, all that data that they have on board is lost whenever they're done with the flight, when they're doing a debriefing. All of that is done mostly on like whiteboard right now. So whenever the session's over, they wipe the whiteboard and they walk away with whatever they learned. So they were trying to retain some of that, well, all of that data basically, and using machine learning and deep maneuver analysis to take this data and being able to represent, re-represent it in real time. So like on the left side, this user interface is the monstro monstrosity of a sidebar. And basically it's all the flight data at a certain maneuver and you'd be able to see the grade or the, each parameter for that maneuver. And right here, I'm just showing uh, just some spacing for all the components. Well, some of the components that I created. Some of these are more typical, like obviously text area and buttons, uh, but this one's more complex with has accordion. But this is how I basically delivered the components, obviously less flashy, but they had all these measurements that I was showing the developer as far as how they should be implemented. And then this is the last image I have, I think. Uh, this would be like the pilot profile page. So on the pilot profile page, you could see what you're scoring for each maneuver. And then you have like an overall grade. And then you would also be placed in a certain percentile range within the entire squadron. Uh, sort of like your class, so you would see like where you fall in it within your class. And the whole reason behind this is that the guys who are planning missions could basically see which pilots do better at certain tasks and assign them to the missions. And this is just some media coverage that our team had gotten. Uh, this is for popular science and then advanced distributed learning initiative, uh, some kind of government blog that is important for in the industry. I don't know much about it, but if I could ask a question yeah. about the project, did you have yeah. like a certain format you followed when you were really um, looking into the layout for this, or how did you come up with the design? Do you think gaming also influenced you with this particular? <laughs> yes, it did. I I would say one of the things that influenced me is kind of like not having that much pressure. I was able to kind of design the coolest thing that I wanted to. Um, like there were requirements, but I I know a certain amount in the domain of aviation that I didn't have to like learn everything all at once. I mean, there was even certain like aviation acronyms that I was kind of explaining to my other team members, just like not having that pressure, being able to be like being able to uh, like exercise my creativity. And um, yeah, I was looking at a lot of patterns for video games. You can see the the planes right there, the red and blue lines. You could almost think of that as a mini map on a video game. I was thinking uh, mini map style and even the different kind of controls that that would possibly be there. But yeah, I was looking at HUDs, uh, like heads up displays for for different games. And I was looking at different airspeed reels and games were definitely an influence for this. No, it's just amazing. I think it's so cool. Yeah, it was really amazing. The shock has kind of worn off now, but 
whenever I was sick, I was, it was really hard for me to contain my excitement. And I just wanted to like tell people so bad what I was doing, but like, I, I didn't want to like violate the contract, even if that, even if it wasn't like going to penalize me. But yeah, so, I didn't have, uh, I didn't have a security clearance or anything like that. Um, they just hired me on Upwork and that that's pretty much it. So it's nothing in secret. You know, I, I'm not, I don't have any kind of secret clearance or qualifications or anything. So uh, that was going to be one of my questions, but um, yeah. another one would be like, how much of this was actually implemented? Because I know that DOD systems, I worked with them for five years are not the best right in most cases so like how much of this was actually a minimum viable product that they used yeah um they were definitely using this we were on like an agile team so every two weeks we were kind of doing software releases basically with like release with release notes this project was kind of axed that's why the team was disbanded basically um i don't i think there was another award that they were going for to continuing to burn capital through but I, and i i don't think they won the award and so the team was disbanded basically but they were actively using the application and giving us feedback as time went on this next slide is uh more related about money. So I, I'm sure people are wondering about that too, kind of the elephant in the room. So kind of in 2021 is whenever my freelancing on Upwork began. And I really started in like July or May, like the sixth of the year. So it's really happy year 2021. But I did make $21,000 in 2021. And at that point, I basically like validated the concept in my mind that you know, freelancing will work out for me. And if I keep at it and do better, then you know, it's only going up from here, basically. And uh, I started out charging $25 an hour, which is pretty normal for like an entry level UX designer. And I wasn't entry level whenever I started on Upwork. I was more like mid level UX designer, which is like $50 an hour in the market rate. Basically, work myself up. And then last year that just ended, 2022, I made. $110,000, which is awesome. I think that's like 50 or $60 an hour full-time. And for 2023, I'm looking at around $200,000 based on the past couple months that I've been working. And, uh, you know, if we need to talk about how to raise your rates, if, if someone's like not happy with their rates or like how to negotiate or like what, what you can do to be able to provide the value to to be able to gain the skills to provide value to the clients we can talk about that as well but i was just kind of showing you know freelancing is real tons of people say that it doesn't work or it's a waste of time i'm here to basically say it does work and it's a really uh, low resistance way to getting a full-time job so you can start doing this right now get real clients real projects under your belt if you want to do full-time freelancing you can but if you want to get a full-time job, it's now much easier. So we do have a question in chat, um, yeah. Christopher. It's from Chris as well. He says, if you are an entry-level designer, how would you go about freelancing on Upwork? You don't have to be the best. Uh, you said to be good enough to feel confident that you're going to deliver results. So if you're going to go on Upwork as an entry-level designer, um, I would basically say, look at other freelancers' profiles on Upwork, see what they're doing. Look at the, the freelancers' profiles who are successful, you know, who are making $100 an hour, who are making $200 an hour, who are making $300 an hour. They're on there. I've seen them. See what their profile looks like. What does their work look like? Uh, chances are their work doesn't look, well, it probably does look better if you're an entry-level designer, but there's a lot of people on there who can charge a lot of money who don't have the most sexiest design work. They just understand how to do business and they understand how to address the client's problems. It may not be a design problem that they have. If I was to ask a question personally for me, because I see you started at the 21,000 and you basically quadrupled in the next year, how did you go about um, changing your rates, especially if you had repeat customers? How did yeah. you navigate that? Well, I kind of looked at Upwork as a video game. Honestly, the more I played it, the more fun I had. After a while, I would jump on a real video game and it wasn't that fun. All I wanted to do was go on Upwork and win another job and raise my rate some more, basically. Um, so yeah, I started off 20, $25 an hour, it's pretty normal. I would suggest anyone, anyone in here to basically charge $25 an hour, unless you're not confident enough. Whenever you are working on a contract, you may not have a full-time contract. 
what that means is you may have 10 or 15 hours during the week extra to get another contract. Like whenever I was working with Azurus, that was about a six or seven month long contract. And during that contract, I would just pick up other smaller jobs. You know, I was making my, my steady income with Azurus, but then I was also kind of doing even more side work to kind of build up my portfolio and get more reviews. Basically, you have to upskill. If you want to charge more, you have to provide more value. And the only way to provide more value is to learn things that you don't know. One of the ways that you could charge more, I was kind of touching on it earlier about like generalists versus specialists. Typically, a specialist can charge more than a generalist. You know, if you were to think about it, you know, if you if you have a heart problem, are you going to go to a mechanic to ask him to fix it? You're going to go to a heart surgeon. You're not going to go to a teacher to fix your heart. Those are more kind of generalist jobs versus specialists. And because they're a specialist, they're in less supply and they're in higher demand and their skills basically have that value in the in the marketplace. And we do have another question in chat. Um, from Chris, it says, how long did roughly each project take you? And were they like four to eight weeks or much longer? Yeah, um, it's really hard to say. Um, there is no kind of average. There's been some contracts I've worked that are just a couple hundred bucks. And there's some that are in the five digits. And, and, and the way that Upwork is kind of geared towards is long-term client. The fee structure, basically like the first $500 you earn, they take 20%, which is kind of a lot. But after $500, they only take 10% off the top. After $10,000, they only take 5%. So they really incentivize you to, to work with clients on a long-term period and not only on like a weekly period. And the same thing applies to like a fixed budget. And we do have another question in chat from Siri Kwong. She asks, was this all remote collaboration? Yes, I'm pretty comfortable with doing video calls. And I find that my clients love it. And that will really set you apart compared to a lot of other people who either don't have the confidence or don't have the will to get on camera. But it's my webcam is what basically got me in the door a lot of the time and it allows me to charge the rates I do because it's a lot more intimate of a relationship that you're able to develop with your clients. And even if they don't have a camera, they're still able to see you. And some of the reviews I'll, I'll show later, they, they express that as well. So yeah, get comfortable with doing video calls and like it would set your it would set you apart from a lot of other people who aren't willing to. And I just ask another question too, because um, you know we just well we mostly came out of the current epidemic we're going through right now. So how would you say just having like that video advantage being more prevalent? in your work by showing your face really bolstered you in a world where we were really stuck at home and yeah. everything was remote work. How do you think um, you really navigated by that? I feel like I'm in more of a unique position because I said, you know, I did freelancing before I was on Upwork years ago. And so that means like I was doing work from home before it was cool. You know, I could basically say like, hey, like I've been doing this before the pandemic, guys. Like you don't have to worry about me, me ghosting you guys because I'm used to this. But yeah, that was one thing that I definitely identified with working with my clients early on is that I noticed that a lot of people were stuck at home and they couldn't do the things that they wanted to. And I could see that in my clients as well. And being able to do video calls with them, they, it gave them that intimate moment that they were looking for. Like I was a stranger, but now I'm not. You get to know each other on a personal level. And that's what everyone has been longing for. They've been longing for just to be closer to people physically, like intellectually. So that's definitely one of the reasons why I think having a webcam is so important if you're going to want to freelance is you get to have that connection with the client. From Adam in the chat, he says, what is the minimum hours per week have you seen on a contract? Curious if I can juggle a freelance job along with a full-time job, which is a really great question. Yeah, I mean, there have been some contracts I've worked that are like five hours a week. Some of them were by choice, some of it wasn't. But uh, yeah, it goes everywhere it's from 40 hours a week to $5 a week. I mean, it's really up to you and the client to come to an agreement on those terms. Like maybe you only want to have meetings on Monday, or maybe you don't want to work during the week and you only want to work during the weekend. Maybe you don't want to have meetings. It, it's totally up to both parties to come to an agreement that they both agree to. Uh, cool. Chris, I actually had a question. Okay. Um, I was wondering if there's some sort of like 
system for yourself that you kind of go through to make sure that you kind of get out of the job what you want like you know like a breakdown list like okay i want to talk about this and the other thing and how much hours i'm going to work on this project and um if there's going to be anyone else working on it with me like do you have something that you've like written down or just kind of just like you wing it every time you mean like negotiating the terms with the client yeah like negotiating the terms and just kind of structuring out how you're going to do the project i will whenever i can scope the project out like for example a client comes to me and wants a mobile app and maybe this mobile app that they want maybe i've designed a similar one so it's a lot easier for me to estimate the workload and give it to them I basically wing it, but I also know what I want. You know, I tell my clients, hey, doing it I an experience, man. What's that? It's just a matter of doing it and getting the experience yeah. and knowing how you're going to do it. Yeah, I mean, there, there's certain things in our life that we're okay and not okay with. Like me, I don't want to wake up early. So I tell my clients, like, hey, if you want to have a meeting at eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning, like, don't hire me, basically. <laughs> and I'll yeah. tell them, like, like, you know, I don't work nine to five, basically. So if you expect me to work like eight hours a day, nonstop for eight hours in a row, like I'm not going to do it. And I tell them, you know, sometimes I like to work on weekends or I like to work late at night. So I just, I let them know, like, if you're not okay with these things, then we're not going to be a good fit, basically. Okay. And nine times out of 10, they are completely okay with it. Probably, uh, you know, 99% of the time they're okay with it. Because I think they understand that as a freelancer, like it's supposed to be a flexible type of job. It's not looked at as like you're an employer. As long as the work's getting done, right? Yep. That's all I care about. With that, I will move on. So I just wanted to kind of briefly go over a couple of reviews. Like these are actually, you know, I was kind of, we were kind of just talking about money a lot because that's the elephant in the room. I think everyone wants to live a better lifestyle and like, this is actually how you get that. You know, you get you get the job, the money from doing the job, but then at the end of the job, you get feedback from the client. And with this feedback, you get promoted in the algorithm. But not only do you get promoted in the algorithm, the clients that want to hire you are able to see this whenever you apply their job or if they find you in the search. I'm just gonna kind of briefly go over some of the things they said just to give you an idea of like how much this is worth in, in words. Chris was immediately excited about the work and easy to communicate with. Hiring Chris brought, brought us instant relaxation. I wholeheartedly recommend Chris's design Figma services as a researcher and designer. He takes into account the entire project at a time, cohesively thinking about the entire flow each type of user may come into contact with. The next one is, Chris's quality of work and commitment to Figma design deliverables, the project timeline, and the satisfaction of the end users was top notch. He is a talented and highly capable designer. The next one is, I was glad to get his feedback and willingness to offer assistance in finding a logo designer that complemented Chris's UI design work. I appreciated the fact that he said we needed a better logo. And when I offered him to do it, rather than taking that and running with it, he said he wasn't the best person to do this, which is a big compliment. Knowing what you are good at and what you are not good at is super important. He helped me sift through some of the people I was looking at. And Chris acted as a sounding board for me while providing real-time feedback and potential suggestions for other things. I wouldn't have come up with any of the ideas that Chris brought up. So this review kind of touches on what my job was like at Michael's by like suggesting different product for people at the store. Like I was basically helping them solve a problem. This one is once we got to the point we we're ready to put in front of real users, the more I realized this is going to need professional attention. So he's looking for a professional. It doesn't mean you have to be an expert. It's just looking for someone who's a UX designer. Christopher took the time to understand the basics of what we're trying to accomplish. I could tell just from the conversation we had before any work began, Chris already had ideas of what to make better. He could tell just from the conversation. He didn't even hire me at this point. The approach to giving his own thoughts on issues before spending a bunch of time on design was great because he demonstrated his ability without actually having to do the work. Chris was able to rationalize every design decision made instead of saying, I don't like this or I don't like that. Being able to get that kind of critique was great, even if it's as much as I got, even if that's as much as I would have been able to get. So he would have been happy with just getting my input and not even giving him any design work because it was so good. I felt 
comfortable that Chris understood the issue and then giving him the chance to diagnose it pretty much confirmed it. So this is what I think a lot of people don't see. It's like they, they're looking for a full-time job and the, the way they do that is with a resume. So first, just to build on it, um, I know it's definitely good when you can get that feedback from local jobs yeah. and everything because it does also build your credibility. Do you feel like just being that person, like that voice behind the design, even you're to just ideate your process, it really helps you to like build yourself as a designer? Because you yeah. did say that you're not entry level, you started off like a mid to senior level, but just having that knowledge and expertise, do you think that also boasted you forward and getting more positive reviews and everything? Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, a mid level designer, but I was at the bottom of the totem pole on Upwork. I had no jobs, zero dollars earned. You know, I had, I had some portfolio work, but so many other portfolios out there that I was just another one of those guys who hadn't gotten hired yet. So it definitely helps. But, you know, I thought whenever I got my degree that, oh, you know, I did everything right. You know, I have a portfolio. I have an online portfolio. I've read my resume 20 times. Like, I'm good. And then I sent out hundreds of applications and I didn't get a full-time job. <laughs> so it may look like the stars are aligned for me, but it, you know, it, it wasn't. You can definitely see the hard work and perseverance you definitely did have, Christopher, especially, you know, coming from 20K all the way up to 190K by this year. That in itself and the metrics are very amazing. Do you have like, based on your experience, because you did say you did have a lot of people who left your reviews, did you have like a lot of repeat people as well too? Somebody who's probably like, hey, I want you on full time, or was it more like contract loads only? I would say my contracts are more long term than they are referral. So I don't really get, I mean, I have a couple, I've had a couple clients who come back, but most of the projects are like six to nine months that I try to get on. And those haven't yet repeated, I guess, I guess due to the nature of the, the length of them. But the Johnson & Johnson one, I think we worked on like three different contracts together. One of them, there was like two, two contracts I did with Johnson & Johnson. And then the third one was with Prism, like with that company. And we do have a, another question in the chat from Tracy. Through yeah. Upwork, you have to use connects and stuff. Other than the obvious, what would you consider to be an advantage of boasting a proposal? Boosting? Boosting? No, no, you don't need to boost. All you have to do is have a good proposal. You know, crafting a good proposal is what will get you a response. You know, if you if you read a job application, if you read a job description and you just copy and paste your proposal, you're going to go straight to the trash can. You basically have to write, you have to custom tailor your proposals. So the job oh, so description. In college. What's that? <laughs> so it's like in college when you're doing yeah. research and stuff like that, you just flip the sentence structure around and reword it. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Okay. All right. So there's some job descriptions that'll be you know, five or six paragraphs long. And there's some job descriptions that may be a sentence or two. And so you kind of have to read the energy of the person who's writing the post. It may be very short and casual, and they have no idea what to do with the website. Or it may be someone who knows exactly what kind of designer they're looking for. And if, you're, if, you, don't fit, if you don't fit this criteria, don't even bother applying. So you kind of have to read in between the lines uh, sometimes, but basically you have to see what their problem is in that, in that job description and address it in your proposal. Yeah, no, that's pretty much all I needed to know. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't really write a lot of proposals anymore, but yeah, dude, I've cranked out hundreds of proposals on Upwork to get here. And you know, a lot of them don't end up in a conversation. They don't end up in a call. They don't end up in an offer. You know, I've only, I've only worked 30 jobs on Upwork and I think like I probably just submitted like 200 to 250 proposals on Upwork. So it's not like you're going to get a job every time you send out a proposal. But the more that you do them, the closer you are to getting that, that next job. I think I have like uh, one more proposal right here to go through. I mean, uh, review. Chris possess possesses exceptional talent in both his understanding, the fundamental, and advanced user interface development, blah, blah, blah. All around that provided an exceptional level of skill and high quality work that was on par professional apps that we see in common day to day. 
We had regular standing calls to update on progress, and we only missed each other when I was unavailable to talk. He's talking about himself. Chris uses a Zoom interface and video call, so you feel like you're sitting with him in person. That's kind of what I was talking about earlier. Furthermore, he was able to articulate ideas and interpret vague guidance toward a final product. Chris, on the other hand, was able to translate my sheer sentiment into a final product. So this was like a one-on-one -on -one type of contract. It was for a mobile app. I had already designed something like this before, so it was kind of simple for me to do. So those are kind of the jobs you want to take, like the ones that you can knock out of the park and get a five-star review on and a good review, basically. You don't, you don't really want to take too big of chances and screw up the job and you get a one-star review and a bad review and then it just bombs your whole, um, profile basically like a sore thumb and if we could just touch on this last question briefly before we move on to the next yeah. map i have a question in chat from tyler and ask do you understand the algorithm enough to give additional insight into it besides the benefits of the feedback yeah um i mean think about it like google um there's like little little bots that basically crawl the internet and like gather data on our websites. And I think one of the other speakers were talking about uh, just like certain, like uh, the accessibility of your website can be like picked up by those bots basically. And so it's very similar on Upwork. Um, it, it's not very public as far as like how it works, but I do know a lot about it. Um, it basically is determined by how many, how many contracts you've worked, like if you've recently closed the contract, you're getting good reviews, um, the job title that you have on your profile, when's the last time you uploaded a portfolio item, uh, the different keywords that are in your job title and in your description, your profile description. So was, you basically want to play with the keywords, you know, in your, in your portfolio, like when you title the portfolio item, you can say, you can add in certain keywords in there to just st not, I don't want to say stuff the keyword stuffing, whereas you're just like uh, spamming with keywords. You don't want to do that. Yeah. That's that kind of goes into looking at what other people are doing on Upwork, like look at their profile and see what, you know, see what works for them because there's certain things that they have and they don't have, but it's also like something you have to learn. And over time you kind of pick up new things and edit your profile. So you, Keep your profile up to date, like every couple months or whenever you have a, a better idea on how to word something, update it, and it, it may keep you or uh, increase your search result in the algorithm possibly. Whenever the, someone looks up UX designer with with a certain criteria, so like even even like the amount of money that you've earned, you could be shown in the search results or not, because some people may have a filter on. You know, only look up people who have made ten thousand dollars or more, or they could be looking up, you know, anyone on Upwork. I'll uh, this is the last one. I know it's probably getting boring, but I just want to kind of show you guys the value of, of this, and this is kind of like how like I don't have to do as much work, and as far as like applying to propose, applying to jobs and doing that, it's all kind of autopilot for me at this point because of these reviews. It, it, I get invites basically, which I'll show next. Basically right here, the, the business went through a lot of changes since the original website launch, but reflecting those changes in the design was a nightmare for me to do. So he tried to do it himself and he realized that he couldn't do it basically. Chris's understanding for the for designing for the web, openness to ideas and criticizing those ideas with the mathematics of why. I appreciated how Chris was able to break down the composition of the design to the bare bones. He's quick to respond and answered all my questions at once. Unlike previous freelancers I've worked with waiting for several days. I would recommend you to work with Chris as I'm satisfied with the results. And then the bottom one, I thought this one was pretty funny, just like how it worked out. This was actually someone in my city who hired me and he was looking for someone locally who did UX design. And whenever we got in contact, I told him like, yeah, the only reason why I know how to do this is because, you know, I taught myself how to do this. I didn't, you know, I didn't go to school for this or anything. So there is no class for that around here. So 
the chances of him actually finding me in the same city was pretty funny, but we, we took it onto Upwork just to make it safe. But so he was looking for he was looking for a UX designer for months, for months. And he hired me just because we we're in the same city. So that's something that you may experience as well. I've had a couple other people that hired me uh, through Upwork that were in the same city as me. And it's just because sometimes people want to know that you're not going to take their money and run. They want to know that you have like something in common together. That's another thing. Like if you can find a thread of similarity with you and the person that you're talking to across the table, they're going to like you a lot faster. They're going to like build rapport with you a lot faster and they're going to feel more comfortable with like taking that chance on you basically they're gonna feel good about taking that chance on you but uh yeah this is a screenshot of my gmail address and these are all invites from upwork and uh i have a filter applied so for the whole screen i think it's like 50 50 emails per screen like these are all invites it's another page of invites another page of invites just kind of showing you guys the power of like having reviews as a freelancer like it's more than just making money like you can show this to a potential employer and say hey like you i think i'm a good designer but here's what 10 or 12 other people who've paid me to do this here's what they think and i think that has a lot of more uh social proof and just market value whenever it's, it's just like on amazon you know like a lot of people go on amazon they look at the product ooh. Maybe I want to buy it and then scroll down and look at the reviews. If there's a bunch of bad reviews, you're probably not going to buy that product. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's any questions related to the reviews or the invites, but. We're just all impressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even going to lie. Like, that's actually impressive, that's, man. That's impressive. Congrats from all of us. Yeah, I hope you all are able to learn something from that. Yeah. Learn quite a bit, especially what it takes to become a top freelancer. Um, you did say you were like in one of the top percentiles as well. Did yeah. You, you were asking like what percent? Yeah. The uh, top one percent. Yeah. So that's amazing. Going from two years to basically lowballing yourself to becoming a top one percent freelancer on Upwork for UX design. So definitely happy, more than happy to hear about your processes and. Um, one yeah, and like I was, I was really like personally struggling at the time too. Like before I got my full time contract, like I was saying before, I was couch surfing. Uh, my, I had an iMac, two thousand thirteen, a late two thousand thirteen iMac, twenty seven inch. You know, it was my baby, and uh, the the motherboard went out, and so it would have been a lot of money to repair the computer. It was wouldn't have costed. It, it wasn't worth the money, basically. So I had to use a, my old laptop, which I had before that computer, and that motherboard uh, went out a couple of months later. So I was couch surfing. I had two computers that failed on me, and I kind of felt like, you know, the only way to, to go was up, and I just kept freelancing, and it worked. So we do have two questions for you in chat. I do know Andrew Christopher, he already mentioned that he didn't have any set time for most projects when it came to it. But we do have a new question too. Um, yeah. Ashley asks, are most people when they come to you looking for just UX or do they want you to do the development side as well? Um, sometimes, but it's not in my skill set. And so mm -hmm. I politely tell them I can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have a friend who does development, like front end development. So I'll recommend him or like we'll team up and do it together if we need to. I always tell my clients, and I'd advise you guys too if if you if you're in the same boat as me. I tell them, you know, I'm strictly a designer. I do not code. Just know that, just so that you're not like expecting anything like that from me. And they come to an understanding all the time. I've never had anyone who is freaked out on me or anything. But mm -hmm. I think there is some kind of expectation sometimes that. Oh, because you're doing something with the website, you probably know how to use WordPress or code or anything like that. But I do not code. Try to HTML and CSS. You know, I can read it, but I can't write it. Yeah, I don't think as a UX designer, you really need to know how to code. It's debatable 
whether like people agree with that in the industry but from my experience i mean i think if you if you want to get really good at something you have to dedicate yourself to it and commit to it basically and i feel like i wouldn't i wouldn't have been able to do that just personally as an individual i wouldn't have been able to do both things and i love design i love the challenge behind it and just what what it does on like a societal level and so i basically put my foot down and determined like i am going to be a designer and that's it so we do have two more well three more questions in chat questions are starting yeah. to <laughs> The first one is from Andrew. Of course, I know we're getting the feeling, but do you prefer freelance to just a normal job? Um, I can't say because I've never had a normal job as a designer. I've only I've only freelanced as a designer. Okay. And I do have another question from Ashley. They ask, are all your deliverables on Figma? Are they all Figma files? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I use a free plan of Figma, so no, nothing special. Um, yeah, everything is pretty much in Figma. I create all the colors in Figma, all the icons, all the components, all the screens, the prototypes. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. We do have two more questions. We're really starting to get them now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you come up with the deliverables as opposed to the contractor? And this is from Adam. Um, yeah, I think I see what he's saying. Um, it depends on the size of the team. So the guy I was telling you guys about the, with the mobile app who hired me in Lafayette, it was just me and him working on the project. So. It also depends on the terms that you come to agreement with with the client. Like sometimes they want to write the requirements. Sometimes they already have the requirements. Um, sometimes they need your help to write the requirements. Um, but there's other contracts like I'm working on now with at Monaco, and you know there's three or four coders that I'm working with, and uh, the the project manager and. There's other people involved, so they have more hands on deck to be able to do those things because they have a lot more closer relationship with the product and the people and the places that they use the product at. So sometimes they gather those requirements and then we kind of go over it together and like approve of it, basically. But a lot of the time I'm doing the uh, deliverables like I'm writing the personas I'm doing the user flows I'm writing user stories but a lot of the time you're contributing at least mm -hmm. we do have some more questions and we're definitely starting to flood it now uh, another one from Siri Kwan says what do you do with bookkeeping bookkeeping yeah so I guess like managing like your general sheets or just um, like, be yeah. like the bill on it. Sir. Paid. Yeah, like how you get paid and who handles the taxes and things like that. Like the CPA. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I need to hire someone for my taxes. I'm going to be doing that this year. Um, I filed them last year, but I kind of want to like, you know, save as much as I can basically. But um, as far as payroll goes, that's all going through Upwork. So like, let's say I worked this week and then when the work week ends on, I think it's like six o'clock in the morning on Monday, that would cover everything from Monday to Monday of this week. And then you wouldn't actually get paid until like a week and a half later. So the paychecks are kind of like delayed. And so what, what I get paid what I got paid this Wednesday was work that I did the week before, basically. Okay. So and, we do. Yeah. They, we do they issue uh, like a 1099 that you can basically file your taxes with through Upwork. So I'm self-employed, meaning I, I don't have an employer. And um, yeah, Upwork is just the middleman, basically. They're the marketplace. I'm not employed by Upwork. I'm not employed by the clients who hired me. Okay, we do have two more questions. 
One is regular and another one is a combo question. All right. so Tyler, they ask, and this I guess will be the last few. Um, do you use the free Figma? I thought it was very limited, which I would say a lot of us do use the free Figma, and we do understand. But how do you navigate that? Yep, I've never paid for a Figma plan. Uh, I mean, I've been on teams that have the pro plan or whatever, but I don't know. I've never really used any of those kind of pro features. Uh, I guess the one the one drawback is the the page limit. Like you're only you only have like three pages per project, um, but you can have three projects per like team, mm -hmm. and you can have unlimited amount of teams as far as I'm aware of. So if you just run out of project space for your team, you can just create another team. I mean, I don't think I've ran out of teams or like you know categories as teams uh, to fill up like extra space. So. I haven't really had a problem with that, but I would say probably the way that I organized my files, since I only have three pages, is I'll have like either a design or like prototype page, which are all the like up-to-date designs or up-to-date prototype for that project. And then the next page, I'll have a design system page. So that'll be like all the icons, all the colors, the type ramp, and all the components. And then the third page is usually like an archive page where it's all the old designs, like everything we basically worked on during the contract is just on this like one page in case we ever need to look at something or go back to an idea we had. It's, it's kind of always there. Mm -hmm. And I guess if I could ask just these last two questions before we move on, you guys. Okay. Uh, first question before the combo is, does the scope of the project change often at all? Do you find yourself using an agile process a lot or just whatever you think is the best for that project? And Ashley also built off from that and said, what role does research play in your process? Do you also use usability testing? Okay. Um, I'll speak so on the first, scope. Yeah, I'll speak on the so, scope one first. Um, yeah. Depends. Uh, I mean, if if you're working with uh, if you're if you're working by yourself and probably like let's just say the mobile app example, um, you know, there's certain features and there's certain pages you agree on, and you know, a lot of the time you get to design that page and it's like, oh, we didn't we didn't think about this requirement, or or the client's like, oh, let's just throw this in. It's not going to be much work. And uh, so you kind of have to limit the scope. And that's kind of why, like, it was kind of like the niche, I guess, I used whenever I was uh, first on Upwork because it was my niche from before, which was like minimum viable products. So it's basically you design a product with like the minimum set of features in order to let users accomplish their goal, basically. So the benefit of that was by limiting the amount of features, you're decreasing your risk for scope creep to happen, basically, where like features just keep being added and added and added. There have been times where I've worked with clients and they're like, oh, can you add this in? Can you add that in? And it's it's a fixed price project. And they don't necessarily understand that they have to pay for that extra effort, basically, that, that wasn't agreed upon at the beginning of the contract. I hope I answered that. But the like more like team related projects or like hourly jobs that I work on, like it's not as big of a deal because I'm being paid hourly. They want me to do more work. That means more hours. So it, it evens out. As far as research, I would say that, you know, I wish I was able to do more or like more specific types of research whenever I'm working on specific projects but sadly as some people may know that um like that's something that people cut out of the process sometimes and when you're working on projects with smaller budgets you don't that's that's one of the things they kind of want to cut out first because they see it as not necessary but i would say at the beginning of the project it's always it's like essential 
basically to do your research. Like you have to, if they have a product already, you have to use their product and see what works and what doesn't work. Once you understand their product, you can go to their competitors' products and see what they do well and what they don't do well and areas of opportunity. Um, like talking to users at the beginning of the design process and like getting their feedback on kind of uh, like what kind of problems they have and things of that nature. Um, I would say doing usability tests is really valuable too. It usually comes, uh, I mean, it, it could come at the beginning of the project if they have a product already and they don't have a firm grasp on what to fix. But usually when you do like a redesign, when you redesign the, the website or the app, you do like a prototype of that that you would put in front of users before you would actually publish it. And I found that to be really uh, insightful to be a part of uh, just being able to observe how users interact with your product. And sometimes you're doing little tweaks in between the user tests. And sometimes you do that one tweak that they just instantly get whatever you just fixed. And it's like, wow, you can see just how quickly they react to it sometimes. I guess that's all the questions we can take for now as we move on. So okay. do not screen you're currently presenting uh, label only by any skill like what's more what's going on on there. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of gonna change gears from the upwork freelancing stuff and get into like what I'm actually delivering. We're talking about deliverables and like one of the deliverables that I work on or seemingly work on a lot now is design systems. So design system, you know, it's more than just the colors and the, the font choice that you want to use or, or even just the components. It's, uh, you know, how, how you write, uh, what kind of icons you use, like how the icons are styled, um, the, the spacing guidelines, um, how dark mode and light mode changes. Um, it's more like the documentation behind the product and uh, I was kind of going to demonstrate here like what what a like a simple component like a button looks like in a design system when you're working with a more complex design so right here this is a button you know a beautiful button right we worked all day and like pick the right color the right font or the right border radius and uh, yeah, it's a label only button, no icon, no border. Um, so I have one right here, this is our one button. And if we wanted to create variants for this button, um, we would basically start with like the, so we could start with the sizes. So you'd have like a 48, maybe a 40 and a 32 pixel uh, height button. And this is just based on some of the spacing guidelines that uh, like Google Material uh, came up with. Basically creating design components that are divisible by two, four, or eight, as well as the spacing between components. So each time we basically add another type of interaction to the button, we're basically like multiplying whatever we have. So we had that first button, and then we want to add a size attribute to it. So one times three equals three. And if we wanted to go to um, like different types of buttons, now we've got five different types of buttons, and five times three is 15. And so if you keep doing this, we'll end up with a lot of buttons, basically. Um, if we wanted to add the different states for each button, so we have like a default or enabled state, and we have a hover state. So whenever you have a mouse, you hover over the button, it would slightly get darker in, in this light mode, at least. Underneath that, we have the active button. So when you actually hover over the button and press on it, not only does the button get one more shade darker, but there's a, a what we call a focus ring around the button, which lets the user know that they just pressed something. And then under that is the disabled state and basically you can't interact with the, a button that's disabled we all know that so right now we've got 60 components we just went from one to three to 15 to 60 
Now, if we wanted to, we could add the focus state to the enabled and the hover button. And now that this brings us to 90 buttons. And if we wanted to go one step further, we could do with icon. So now we have just regular buttons with a text label, and then we have buttons that have an icon inside of them. And if we really wanted to, we could design icon only buttons as well. So we have buttons with just the label, we have buttons with a label and an icon, and then we have buttons that are just an icon. So at this point, now we have a lot of buttons, and now we need a way to um, like use these buttons, basically. So we would create a button, and uh, each one of these, uh, a button component, and each one of these buttons would be a different variants. Uh, I don't really have the time to demonstrate the variant creation, but there's plenty of tutorials on YouTube. Um, yeah, but essentially, I think I have, yeah, I was going to talk about, like, how to basically create components. And I think this is one thing that isn't really taught much that helped click in my head, at least, like, how auto layout works because I was struggling with auto layout a lot whenever I first learned how to use it. It was really frustrating. But once I learned this concept, uh, it helped me out a lot. This is basically the box model concept, and it's basically like how design components end up in the browser when they're coded. So if you were to look at like the center of the object, we have the content. So this could be anything from an image to text or an icon. And outside of that, or directly outside of that piece of content, we have the padding. So you could think of that as the button. The button text is the content. And the, the container of the button itself, everything inside the button, including the padding, is the, the button. And then in that container, you can also have a border. So if we wanted, we could have a border on our button or not. And this is an example I had earlier, we didn't. And then when you have more than one uh, design element, the spacing between those two elements is called the margin, basically. So I kind of am like constructing a button from scratch to kind of show you guys like step by step. So I know some people were struggling. I just kind of wanted to go through it really quick, but Right here, I basically have a button, a piece of text. It's just a piece of text by itself, and I have it selected. Now, if I wanted to create the container for this button, I would not use the rectangle tool. I'm going to repeat this. Do not use the rectangle tool. What you're going to want to do is use the frame tool, and you're going to want to turn on auto layout. But the shortcut to do this would be Shift plus A. So if you have a piece of text selected, all you have to do is press Shift plus A. And what this does is it creates a frame around whatever you have selected. And it pre-applies these settings, basically. So it'll uh, horizontally align the objects in that frame. And it'll automatically put 10 pixels of spacing between any objects within that frame. In this example, we only have one object. It's the piece of text. And then we have 10 pixels of space vertically and horizontally. So going from here to here, we can visually see the 10 pixels vertically and horizontally that are added. Then from here, you know, I added 10 pixels horizontally, so it makes it more proportional. And um, I added a fill to it with uh, rounded edges, just so you can tell it's a button. And now if you added another button and created a frame around both of it created an auto layout frame around both of those. Now you'd have, now you'd be able to see the spacing between the two objects. And if you were to change that value, it would change accordingly to the frame because you have auto layout applied basically. So I just wanted to kind of help out you guys with the auto layout stuff because it 
it definitely will excel your speed and give you those skills to be able to charge higher rates basically because this is a very in demand skill that not everyone knows in figma and like i've like my johnson and johnson contract they hired me specifically because i knew how to use the advanced features in figma that that the designers at johnson and johnson weren't able to learn because they were so busy doing their job that they didn't have time to learn all the new stuff that that's added into Figma every other month. But I do because I'm a freelancer. And that's that's what, like what we do as a freelancer, basically, where you're always upskilling. So I do have a question for you, uh, Christopher. Yeah. I also have one first from Tyler. He asks first, do you think auto layout is easier to understand how HTML, CSS works at least a little bit, if you can briefly touch upon that? Yeah. Um, like I said, I'm not really a coder. I'm not a programmer at all, but I, I can I can look at a piece of HTML or CSS and kind of tell what's going on for the most part. Um, and just as a designer, like you're going to be working with front end developers who are going to be coding your design visually, basically. So just being able to understand and communicate with them at a high level makes their job a lot easier. It makes them want to work with you. It mm -hmm. makes the whole relationship like pleasant, basically. Um, me personally, whenever I discovered this kind of box model concept, which is used to, to create designs for the web, something clicked for me um, that didn't before. Uh, while I was struggling to learn auto layout, and I just wanted to kind of share with you guys because it may click with someone, it may not, but it, it takes a lot of time to like really understand auto layout, but I think it's worth it. And I have a question personally. Yeah. When you show the two buttons, did you make a variant to the right hand side or did you copy the button? How did you make the second button? Yeah, in this example, I just copied it and changed the color, but that would be like a different button variant, basically. So like if we were to go back to here, so mm -hmm. the blue button would be like your primary button. And in this example, the gray one would be the secondary uh, emphasis. And then the one on the bottom left with the outline, which you could call like a ghost button or outline button. Um, that's like the, the tertiary uh, emphasis and then the one to the right of that is just the label by itself uh, so that one's even lower emphasis so yeah those would be different uh, emphasis of the same button basically so you would have this button thing with the purple frame this would be like your button component in your design system and then you could just pull out whichever buttons you wanted to create this Awesome. And I do think we have, let me see, another question. Oh, yeah, just compliments. Uh, one from Mika. Thank you for talking on auto layout. It's so helpful, which I agree. With. Um, <laughs> no it just took me a little bit to get used to it. And Tyler says, yeah, I've been using the rectangle tool, like, pull this whole time. I don't yep. think you're a fool, Tyler, which I know Chris will definitely agree on. Just getting used to auto layout and the different tools is a process. It's not something you get immediately. So. Yeah. 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 And we were having the conversation in the last call about just like some of the habits I think a lot of us have picked up on from using Photoshop. And like in Photoshop, you know, if you want to make a, a square or like a button size shape, you would use a rectangle tool. It, it absolutely makes sense. But in Figma, if you use a rectangle tool around a piece of text, you can't use auto layout. You have mm -hmm. to use a frame. And you basically put like the button that you're, you're looking at, the blue button, uh, it's basically a frame with a, a radius on the corners that, that make it look like a button. So that's why I basically say don't use rectangles and don't use circle tools uh, when you're trying to use auto layout. You, you pretty much always use frames. And there, there are exceptions to when you want to turn auto layout off. But that's really when you're only like hacking things together and it's a rare exception when you actually have to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much for that input. Yeah. 
I mean, I love using auto layout and I understand the frustration around it, trying to learn it. So I just wanted to spend a couple minutes like um, sharing some of that knowledge. And uh, this is like the last thing about, well, second to last thing about the auto layout. Basically, like whenever you create uh, a new auto layout frame, like you have these options on the right for the spacing and the alignment. But at the top of this slide, you also have um, selectors for the boundaries of the element. So we have fixed, we have hug, and we have fill. You can kind of pretend like fixed isn't there because we don't really need it. Um, we're mostly using just either hug or fill. And if we were to look at these buttons, like if you were to say, is it hug or is it fill? Basically, all of this is hug. The, the containers around the button are hugging the text. And then the container around the buttons, the larger container around the buttons is also hugging both the buttons. So it's really if you want something to be, if you want something to span across the entire page or whatever space isn't taken up, you would change it to fill. If you want things to be compact and Similar to like a button, you would keep it to hug. So this is an example I just wanted to kind of use and dissect was our beloved Figma. You know, everyone in here I think knows how to use Figma. And this is kind of like a quick, quick and dirty mock-up of like what Figma looks like. So there's some elements in here that are set to hug. And there's some elements in here that are set to fill. And so I think the easiest example would be like the sidebars. So we have like the left and the right sidebar that go all the way up the screen. So if you were to look at this as an auto layout, like these sidebars basically are set to hug horizontally. So if we were to if we were to stretch the Figma screen out, the sidebars are going to stay the same width. The sidebars aren't going to expand all the way into the center of the screen, they're going to stay where they are unless we we change the, the position of them physically. But the the inside of the container, like where we would actually have our artboards and our frames at, that is set to fill, and it's set to fill vertically and horizontally. So like the bigger screen you have, the more space you have in the center. And the smaller your screen is, the less space you have in the center. Um, so yeah, you can play with using, you know, sometimes you want to use fill vertically, sometimes you want to use fill horizontally, sometimes you want to use fill horizontally and vertically. Um, so it just depends on the use case. Um, if we were to look at the toolbar at the top, I think that's another good example. Um, the elements inside of the toolbar, they're all set to hug. So we have like the circles, the white circles, with uh, a blue square around one of them, and that's just showing the selected state. Like that's the tool we have selected. And so that button, that icon only button right there, that would be set to hug. You know, that button isn't spanning all the way across the container. So all five of those buttons at the top left, we know they're set to hug. And if we look at the top right, we've got like the avatar of whoever is in the file, and then we have the share. So those are both set to hug too. If we, if we change the size of the label inside of the button, the button itself would expand. And if you were to look at the background for the toolbar that goes horizontally, you'll see that does span across the entire screen. So that's set to fill. But if you look at the height of the toolbar, it's set to hug. So if the, if the content inside the toolbar was bigger, then the height of the toolbar would automatically adjust. Whereas when it's set to fill, if the content overflows, it can't grow any larger because it's already taking up 100% of that uh, either length or width. So this is kind of a good example of both hug and fill um, properties. And then I was going to go to more straightforward example here with just like a mobile app design. So 
with the buttons, usually on mobile apps, buttons are set to fill. So with the login and the continuous guest, you can see that they're taking up the width of the entire container minus the padding or the margin on the left and the right. But if you were to look at the bottom of the mobile app, you'll see that there's a like a, a low emphasis button that says get started. And so the height of that would be the same height as the buttons you see, but the width would be set to hug. So that button on the bottom doesn't span all the way across, it's just whatever label is inside dictates the width of the button. So these two different examples, the buttons, you know, this button is set to hug, this button is set to fill. And you can basically use this with all your components to create fully responsive designs for mobile, tablet, and web. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? It's pretty much pretty much done. All right. Well, uh, we could still bug you for hours, but uh, you know, you probably got video games you want to play or something, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, probably going to make some chicken after we're all done. So look forward to that. But yeah, I, I was going to leave you guys with some some book recommendations. Um, behind me, I do have a lot of books. I haven't read them all, probably only about half. But I found that reading books early on in my design career um, really helped me. And kind of one of the strategies that I did was you know, I'd get a, get a project, I'd make a couple hundred bucks or a couple grand, and I would buy a book or two. I'd buy them used as well because they're cheaper. So every time I was finishing a project, you know, I got paid. I, I had portfolio work. But then I would also buy a design book, and I would level up my skills. And I would do another project and repeat it all over, rinse and repeat. So uh, this first book, is uh, Smashing UX Design. And these are all my recommendations, so I'm not saying these are the best books you could possibly buy, just you know, my opinion. Um, but this one I think is a really comprehensive book. I think it covers all the bases. And I think if you just wanted to read one book and just be over with it, you know, I think this is a really um, good option for, for someone like that. And I, I kind of uh, identified, you know, there's certain Certain people will probably want to read a certain type of book, so I kind of have like a variety here. Um, the second example, I labeled this one most easiest to read. So this one is a really small book. It's like, I don't know, like a fourth of an inch tall. Um, it just goes over the essentials, and like if you're not really a reader, or if you just want to read one book and kind of be over with it, and you don't want to look at another book again, like. You could read this and be pretty good and have a good foundation, I think. Um, the third book right here, I think this one is a really good book. I think you know anyone in here should read it if they're going to be a UX designer. But it's mostly about usability and like creating designs that are intuitive. So I don't know if anyone remembers what the internet was like, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, but a lot of the time you would go into a website and there would be like a paragraph at the top of the website with like instructions on how to use the website. Like, oh, this is the navigation and click this button to go here. And this is what you can do if you want to do that. And it was just these long winded things that uh, webmasters were essentially including in their websites to, for people to be able to use their website because it wasn't intuitive. And so basically, user research, um, information architecture, um, that sort of thing. So if you're really fascinated with users and usability, I would definitely read Don't Make Me Think. I think it's a good title for a book, too. You literally don't want users to think when they're using your application because it's so simple or so, so straightforward and clear for them to use. I don't want to just say simple. So the last one, you know, this isn't really a book I recommend all the time, but you know, if anyone is, uh, if anyone loves UX design and they are looking for a challenge and uh, 
I don't know, looking for something different, I guess. Uh, this information architecture for the World Wide Web, it's about a thousand pages. There's zero pictures, and uh, it's all about how to organize information on the screen. So I put most boring because, you know, no pictures, and uh, I think it's a little bit outdated as far as terminology goes, but while when I read this book, it was extremely insightful. Um, you know, this this goes for not just displaying content on the page, but you know, uh, search like advanced searches and navigation, like how users navigate complex websites that have hundreds of pages, or mobile apps or web apps that have suites of products. Um, if you want to learn how to organize all that information, that last book would be for you. And uh, that's it. So. Hope you guys learned something. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Chris, for doing that very wonderful, well-detailed webinar, as I can agree. You're getting a high applause and accolades <laughs> definitely in the chat. We've learned a lot from you, and we're very happy to hear from you. So yeah, definitely, thank you, thank you yeah, so thank much. You. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So yeah, as I just want to dissect, uh, what I've been up to the past year and a half or two, I'm not very uh, social media oriented, you know, so yeah, I like to do my work in the shadows. <laughs> yeah, and definitely we're been posting um, a link to Christopher's LinkedIn, definitely in the chat. Please feel free, everyone, to check him out. He's also one of our professionals in LabCoat UX. He joins a lot of our webinars and chats, and it's very helpful getting his insight. I have personally learned a lot from him, and we'll also like to have you as well if you're not already with us. So definitely thank you so much, Chris. And if anybody has any last-minute questions or if anything, feel free to shoot now. Other than that, I think we're pretty much good to go here. Yeah, I liked all the questions. I wasn't uh, expecting that many questions, but yeah, definitely enjoyable. Questions are always good. Thanks a lot, Chris, for joining us and hosting this. I appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. You can always bug me if you need to. Absolutely. All righty. And if that's if ever, anyone, we're also going to be posting this on our new YouTube channel, also in our LinkedIn and on our website. So please feel free to check us out on LabCoat UX. Of course, it's okay if you're not already in the Discord because we'll be having a website too. So that being said, we do thank you all for joining everybody and of course also our members too and most likely Christopher Denise. It was a very amazing talk and I hope you all have an amazing rest of your night. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris. This was really great. Loved it. Y'all yeah. take care. Take care. Bye.